Welcome to the 2020 Bartlett Lectures. This endowed lecture series was established through the generosity of Robert M. Bartlett and his wife, Sue Bartlett. Reverend Bartlett was a graduate of the 1924 class of YDS. They had very long and distinguished lives that included a number of interests which have given rise to three foci for this endowed lecture series. The first focal point is a result of their heritage. They were descendants of the original pilgrims in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And in fact, they lived in the same house as one of those families and were the 10th generation to live in that house. The second focus was a result of Professor Bartlett's three-year period as a member of the faculty in Yanqing University in Beijing, China. And the third focal point resulted from the rest of their careers back here in the United States, where in addition to doing kind of the standard type of things like serving on the faculties of Boston University and Michigan State University, they did a couple of things on the side, like help to establish the United Church of Christ, the World Council of Churches, and the National Board of Christians and Jews. They were busy people. That gave rise to the third focus point, which is democracy, human rights, and peace. We're fortunate that a number of our recent lecturers have talked about China. People who were themselves very expert. The most recent was Benny Tai, who's been in the news again lately because of his opposition to the government in Beijing and their imprisonment of him or house arrest of him. Tonight, we're fortunate to have another distinguished speaker. And to introduce him, we have our own internationally recognized star, uh, Professor Chloe Starr, who is one of the world's authorities on Chinese theology. Chloe. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's Bartlett lecturer. Today's lecture is a feast of wit and joie de vivre, joining music, harmony and rhythm with mathematics, cosmology, philosophy, etymology to answer the question, is music joy? I shan't give away the answer, but I can guarantee that this zany presentation will change the way you approach the question. Professor Daniel K. L. Chua, Choi Fun Leung, is the Mr. and Mrs. Kong Ching Ying, Professor in the Arts and Chair Professor of Music at the University of Hong Kong. He received his BA and PhD in Musicology from Cambridge University. Before joining Hong Kong University to head its School of Humanities, he was Fellow and Director of Studies in St. John's College, Cambridge, and later Professor of Music Theory and Analysis at King's College, London. He's been a visiting senior research fellow here at Yale, a Henry Fellow at Harvard, and held a prestigious JRF at Cambridge for several years. He's a recipient of the Royal Musical Association's Dent Medal, and is currently the president of the International Musicological Society. As you might expect, he serves on numerous advisory, editorial and governing boards across the globe. Professor Choi has written widely on music, from Monteverdi to Stravinsky, but he's particularly known for his work on Beethoven, and we see a little of that in today's lecture. And the history of absolute music, the intersection of music, philosophy and theology are his other fields. His books include The Galitzin Quartets of Beethoven, Absolute Music and the Construction of Meaning, and Beethoven and Freedom. He's currently working on a post-human theory of music inspired by NASA's Voyager project. We welcome you. And if you're watching, Daniel, Kwai Lai, Zhao Shan Hao. Welcome to the University of Hong Kong and welcome to my office. As you can see, this is going to be a homemade, phone made, and an alone made video. But uh, don't worry, this lecture won't rhyme all the way through. Actually, while I'm setting things up, I might as well just say that uh, this video will probably take a few days to make. So if my wardrobe or my hairstyle changes, just ignore it. 
Oh, and um, I should mention that I am a musicologist and not a theologian, so I may make some theological faux pas, but just be a good theologian and forgive me. Right, well, let's go. Wish me luck. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to give this year's Bartlett Lecture. I'm sorry that I can't be with you and deliver this lecture in person at the Yale Divinity School. I'm very sorry about this, mainly because this lecture actually comes with a meal afterwards with the Dean of Divinity. Now, I don't know what his cooking is like, but I'm sure it's divine. So I'm very disappointed. Now, the Dean did ask me to give this lecture live from Hong Kong, but trust me, you do not want to see me live from Hong Kong at 5 a.m., mostly because I don't look particularly live at that time. So I'm making this video instead, and it's going to be a very long video because the Q&A session afterwards will be live, and I want to get as much sleep as I can. The Bartlett Lecture requires me to touch on issues of human rights, justice, and peace. And I'm going to do this obliquely by sharing with you some work that I did in conjunction with your very own Yale Centre for Faith and Culture on the Theology of Joy. My talk today is entitled, Is Music Joy? The first thing you need to know about this title is that it is a big mistake. Sadly, is music joy is a miserable research question, and it is sad on so many levels. In fact, I'm sure that many of you, when you saw the title of this lecture, thought to yourself, how naff, how naive, how out of date. In fact, I don't even know why I'm saying this, because those people are probably not even coming to this lecture. But the truly sad thing about this research question is that it is intellectually flawed. Is music joy? Well, the short answer to this question is no, music isn't joy. And there are many reasons for this, including some really obvious ones. For example, sad music exists. Duh. Or what about this one? Why reduce music, which is so complicated, to just one thing? And in fact, of all things, why reduce it to an emotion which has no permanent right to claim any ontological significance. And in any case, no one does this type of reductive thing anymore in the humanities, Daniel, really. To boil music down to its essence risks essentializing music. It is a recipe for stereotypes. It is just way too one-dimensional. Yeah, that's so true and so sad. Or what about this argument? Joy? Oh, come on, Daniel. Nobody does joy. Everybody in academia does happiness research. Happiness is great. Happiness is mindful. It's measurable. It has an index. And everybody in America pursues happiness. It's in the Declaration of Independence. Joy, on the other hand, well, that's pre-independence, right? It's pre-modern. It's not trendy. It's not in America. It's not in academia. And it's certainly not in musicology. In fact, joy is a quaint term that some endearing aunt might make about music over a cup of tea. Something like this. Daniel, I find Beethoven's music so joyful. Yeah. Yeah, um, cucumber sandwich? Speaking of um, Beethoven, a case could be made for joy in Western music because its loudest and most canonical work is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Unfortunately, Beethoven's Ode to Joy in recent scholarship has been criticised as an odious joy. I mean, the text basically says, if you can't be joyful, get out. And it doesn't say this in a nice and polite way. No, it's pretty violent. Now, do you remember that tenor solo? It's basically one of these recruiting songs. It begins with just one person, and then everybody joins in this march for joy. Oh, 
Having gathered his forces together, Beethoven combines a military theme with a hunting theme to form a fugue, which Wagner calls battle music. And this music builds up and builds up at a galloping speed. And then there's an eerie silence. It is almost like a Hollywood scene where you know there's something coming over the crest of the hill, but you can't see what it is. And then suddenly there's this army, this brotherhood of joy coming over the hill at great speed. And you are trampled by joy. No wonder Wagner used the Ninth Symphony to incite violence during the 1848 revolutions. In fact, Nietzsche spoke of the joy of the Ninth Symphony as a tragic joy. As far as Nietzsche is concerned, the joy in the Ninth Symphony is like a Dionysian rave party with everyone celebrating their own meaningless annihilation. And the only one that gets to enjoy this is this primal unity, this cosmic will that watches our meaningless lives as if it were a beautiful tapestry. <laughs> Beethoven's Ode to Joy is not merely an odious joy, it is a meaningless frenzy. To base music on this great canonical masterpiece of the Western repertory is not to base music on joy, it is to base it on tragedy. Now for Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy is from the spirit of music. And he got this tragic view from a man whom Heidegger, who is not exactly a bundle of joy himself, described as the philosopher of the cosmic principle of grumpiness. Yes, grumpy old Arthur Schopenhauer. He regarded music as a direct copy of this cosmic will, which means that music at its very core is ontologically pure grumpiness. This tragic view of music has persisted since the 19th century with Arthur Schopenhauer and all the way to the grumpy old men of our postmodern era. Here, for example, is grumpy old Philippe Lecou Le Bas. He says this of music. What moves me in music is my own mourning. Pretty grumpy, huh? And here is the father of postmodernism himself, Jean Francois Lyotard, writing in his grumpy old age. He says, Life laments its precariousness in an ever forgotten anonymous death rattle. I maintain that music gets its beauties and emotions from the evocation of this condition of abandonment that is loud and mute, horrified, moist, whether promiscuity without alterity. I'm not sure exactly what he means, but it's definitely grumpy. Anyway, so in summary, joy is a bit sad, really. To ask if music is joy is to create the conditions for its misery. So really, I should end my lecture here, but I still need my beauty sleep. So let's imagine instead that my premise, my fundamental premise is correct. Music is joy. Now, that would be a very disconcerting and scary thought because it would imply that all the obvious arguments I've just given you are in fact blind to the meaning of the question. There would clearly be something amiss in our current thinking. If music is joy, then we are not in the right place to see it, and to see it would require us to take some kind of a speculative leap from some peculiar angle and squint past these obvious blockages so that we can see something about music that is joy. So let's take this speculative leap and reorientate our thinking. <laughs> We 
we begin our reorientation by shifting east right here in China. But we have to dial back the clocks about 2,400 years. Our succinct research question would have the opposite effect in ancient China. Is music joy would not be worth asking, not because it is obviously false, but because it is obviously true. You see, in Chinese, music is joy. This is because the very character of joy is indelibly part of the music, and quite literally so. The word music in Chinese has two characters, yin yue, and one of them is joy. Although pronounced differently, the written character yue, meaning music, is the same as the written character le, meaning joy. Now, we could quibble over whether this homograph was merely coincidental, but the Confucian classics clearly equated the two meanings. Now, unfortunately, the Book of Music is now lost, but a severely redacted version has been preserved in the Book of Rites. And in that book, it clearly states, music is joy. And in texts from about 400 to 200 BCE, the two terms, music and joy, are often regarded as equivalent. Now, this was not just some play of words, because this joy was associated with a cosmic order. The entire universe was at stake in this homograph. Joy, in its homographic hypostasis, was ontological. Now, I have no idea what that means, but you know, you're a smart theologian, so you can work that out. So joy in its homographic hypostasis was ontological. It was a form of ethical well-being that kept society in equilibrium with the cosmos. Joy as the primary state of being outlined a well-measured existence, balanced, impartial, and under control. This equilibrium was literally measured with the use of bamboo pipes, which set the standard for weight, measure, and volume, as well as providing a form of mathematical modelling for joy's moral order. Music, then, was the measure of all things in a universe where scientific and moral standards were inseparable. In human society, joy operated as a kind of restraining order that kept excessive behaviour at bay through its perfectly balanced calibrations. Keeping in tune with the harmony of the cosmos was a matter of inner character, and making music was a form of spiritual discipline that regulated the affective self and fine-tuned its being with the natural order. This inner harmony authenticated the outward rituals and courtly etiquette that governed society imbuing the social order with a cosmic joy. Joy, then, was a musical relation that brought all things into balance, upholding the moral integrity of the universe from the movements of the stars to the political affairs of court. It was a kind of fittingness, an aesthetic propriety that kept humanity in rhythm with the cycles of the cosmos. As Confucius himself says, it is from music that one's perfection is achieved. Chinese music theory had a parallel universe in ancient Greece, the Pythagorean music theory. Now, Although the tuning of the Pythagorean system was calculated by using strings rather than bamboo pipes, it was equally cosmic and similarly fixated in keeping everything in proper proportion. It ordered the universe in a series of immutable ratios that kept the world in perfect harmony. However, its numerical abstractions were not particularly joyful, at least not until they were transfigured by Christian theology. The good news was an eruption of joy 
in history, and it disrupted these timeless measurements of the Pythagorean cosmos. In his exhortation to the pagans, Clement of Alexandria, for example, reconfigured Pythagoras' universe by personalizing the abstract numbers with Christ. Truth is no longer a numerical ratio, but a musical logos. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word, states Clement, composed the universe into a melodious order so that the whole world might become harmony. Christ is renamed by Clement as the new song, simultaneously melody and the instrument of praise to God the Father. And humans, as a microcosmic reflection of this order, have their fallen nature tamed by the new song, becoming like Christ as an instrument of worship inspired by the breath of the Holy Spirit and filled with the Logos, the Word himself. A redeemed humanity even gets to duet with Christ, with the rest of creation forming a kind of backup orchestral accompaniment. Christ is the truth that turns the harmony of the cosmos into a symphony of celebration. The song of the gospel retunes a fallen universe in order to reconnect all things to God through a doxological relationship in which Christ is the mode for a new harmony. In this theology, music is joy. Celebration structures the very integrity of the universe. Now, two centuries later, St. Augustine was to experience a similar transfiguration of Pythagorean music theory in his conversion to Christianity. Hallelujah. Augustine began his work on music the Musica, as he prepared for baptism in Milan under Bishop Ambrose. And he completed the six volumes on music when he returned to Africa. The Musica can almost be read as a symbol of conversion. The arid application of Pythagorean numbers to poetic meter in the first five books suddenly erupts into a theology of music in the sixth book, inspired by Bishop Ambrose's hymn, Deus Creator Omnium. Now the final book is not so much a culmination of a gradual process, it is a radical conversion. In book six, Augustine declares that God, the creator of all things, Deus Creator Omnium, is music. And this eternal immutable source sings creation into existence ex nihilo, bestowing a melodious measure on all things. Music, in its numerical perfection, is the hymn of the universe, he says, and any passing pleasure that it gives on earth only finds its joy when directed towards its highest immutable state in God himself. Music is not simply the science of measuring well, as Augustine famously defined music. In the sixth book, music is joy. The hymn of Ambrose rhymes with the hymn of the universe and so transports the singer through this doxological relationship from the physical to the transcendental realm where the affective dimension of joy finds its rest in an unchanging state of joy in God. Deus creator Our brief travels back in time to defamiliarize music has taken us to ancient China, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, and ancient North Africa. For Confucius, for Clement of Alexandria, for Augustine, joy is a measure, a musical measure. Now, it is not a measure in the sense of the happiness index that quantifies joy in the current fad for scientific measurements, because joy for the ancient world does not have a sliding scale. It is an absolute ratio, not so much a quantity as a quality that is fixed by the immutable laws of music. To claim that music is joy is to give it 
a permanent structure in a universe which, like the stars in the heavens, was supposed to orientate the earthly traveller along the path of the good life. Glancing back at the ancient world, we can conclude that music was joy. But is it joy? Is it joy today? Well, let's just face it. The answer is basically no, because everything has changed. Joy has changed, science has changed, and music has changed. Let's take joy. That well-tempered, well-behaved, well-proportioned joy of the ancients just no longer resonates with the more hedonistic and happy conceptions of joy in our contemporary world. As for science, well, science has also changed for the better. Because we know that the universe isn't composed of very simple, if beautifully proportioned, integers. And as for music, well, the ideal Pythagorean music was inaudible and timeless, which, if you think about it, just takes away everything from music that is music. I mean, you're not going to download Pythagoras' greatest hits on your iPod. I mean, that Pythagorean music really rocks just isn't going to happen, even if you turn that volume knob up to 11. But before we consign ancient music and its moral and scientific measurements to the trash heap of interesting but useless ideas in intellectual history, let's ask ourselves what can be retrieved from these peculiar ideas for today. You see, when the ancient writers equated music and joy, they were not simply espousing some kind of speculative science to satisfy their abstract minds. It was a practice. It was a form of life that provided an affective and moral structure, despite their erroneous conceptions of the cosmos. The numbers, if you will, just provided a false sense of security or a kind of creative accounting to underwrite the good life. The accounts were ultimately spurious, but joy and music still provided a formal structure for living. So the question is this. In what sense can joy be a form of living today, a form articulated by music as a way of being in the world? Now, in current psychology, joy is one of the six basic emotions famously described by Paul Ekman in his studies in the 1970s. Aptly, the idea of categorizing these primary affects can be traced back to the Confucian Book of Rites. Unlike ancient China, the modern basic emotions are neither tied to music or ritual since they are innate reflexive behaviours hardwired in the nervous system designed for survival rather than for social etiquette. Now, of the six emotions, joy is the only positive one and has attracted the least amount of research among psychologists for whom anger, disgust, fear, sadness and surprise seem to be more pressing. Now, one possible reason for its neglect may be joy's rather diffuse and ill-defined nature. Joy is really hard to locate. I mean, there's nowhere in the brain where you can say, well, joy is here or here. Now, we know that pleasure has specific locations in the hypothalamus, but these centers are related to addiction, to the reduction of hunger, and to sexual drives, which are hardly the stimuli for joy. Joy seems to be distributed across the central nervous system. It's a very complex coordination rather than a specific location. In fact, its coordinates transcend the self because you cannot self-induce joy like excitement. It can only take place in relation to something or someone else. In other words, joy is always a connection. As one of your professors of divinity, Miroslav Volf, writes, joy is the emotional attunement between the self and the world. This outward ecstatic relation ensures that joy is not an emotion that can be mastered, pinned down, or possessed. It has to be discovered as a kind of surprise or some kind of a serendipitous fit. And as a fit, there is something permanent about this relation because joy unlike pleasure, cannot be satiated. However ephemeral the initial delight, the fit 
does not disappear once it is satisfied. As long as the fit is in the right relation, joy always remains. Joy wants eternity. It wills itself as a permanent state. Joy, then, seems to be a persistently open structure. In fact, Robert C. Roberts claims that joy is so unbounded that it does not constitute a distinct emotional type of its own. Joy, he writes, is the general form of positive emotions. It is the underlying relational framework in which positive emotions operate. For example, hope is joy in future prospects. Triumph is joy in winning. Pride is joy in excellence. All positive emotions, states Roberts, can be translated as a type of joy. Indeed, Roberts states that joy must have a propositional structure attaching it to another emotion in order for it to exist. In other words, pure joy would be empty. At least it would be a relational abstraction. Now, this relation is simply described by Roberts as a concern that is satisfied. You see, as an open form, joy is so diffuse that it can absorb all kinds of paradoxical and even contradictory emotions. Happiness has to be happy to remain happy. But joy, well, joy can incorporate sadness and still be joyful. And this is particularly true of the Christian tradition. I mean, all kinds of horrible, terrifying, painful things can happen to you, and you can still count it as all joy. And this includes Jesus' crucifixion. But even a less horrifying propositional structure, such as hope is joy in future prospects, implies that despite an unhappy present, there is an underlying structure of joy without which hope would lose its identity as hope. In fact, since joy is a relationship, hope can only be built on joy's fittingness with something bigger out there that is for us. Now, this something can range from the most mundane to the most transcendental of relationships. The loyalty of a dog, the beauty of nature, the camaraderie of friends, the love of a mother, the goodness of humankind, the order of the universe, the providence of God. This something bigger out there, of whatever size, is joy's cosmic dimension. Now, given this open relational structure, joy's very definition begins to resonate with the harmonious workings of the ancient cosmos. Joy as a primary state of being orders a moral universe. The diffuse identity of joy, then, in the modern world resonates with the speculative metaphysics of the ancient world, of course, not in terms of its calculations, but as a fit or a proportion in which these relationships are brought into a virtuous, if not a virtuosic, balance. We might call this joy's aesthetic dimension. And this aesthetic dimension is both a permanent structure founded on a beautiful relationship and a timely affect that animates the well-being of those relationships. Now, the big question is, in what sense is this modern definition of joy musical? Of course, music theory today no longer concerns itself with an old cosmic geometry. But strangely, it has not been able to escape from Pythagoras's orbit either. You see, the problem is, it is fixated with harmonic order. It is fixated with harmony, with tonality, with pitch relations and pitch centers. But is harmony really the fundamental form of music? The question was largely ignored for two millennia because the music of the spheres was not mainly about pretty mathematics. It was a matter of social control. By keeping music in order, you could keep society in order. You see, there's a reason why the modern world rejects ancient conceptions of joy. The ancient joy was a bit of a killjoy kind of joy for control freaks. In both Pythagorean and Confucian traditions, 
The ugly underbelly of this harmonious order was the fear that music had the power to get out of hand and corrupt society. And of course, this has its theological forms too. An unruly music could profane the order of worship with all manner of sensual delights. Music's excess had to be reined in by the calculation of numbers or the cogitation of words to provide some kind of conceptual grip on these uncontrollable emotions that music might induce in the unwary listener. Music's speculative theory, therefore, was designed to control the body and to dematerialize music's physical effects into timeless and silent truths of the universe. Harmony was therefore fundamental to music theory, not primarily for music, but for social propriety. The good life, joy, was always in danger of becoming authoritarian coercion. Music, however, is not fundamentally harmony. It is fundamentally rhythm. Whereas it is possible to imagine a music without harmony, such as a drum solo, for example, it is not possible to imagine a music without rhythm. In fact, the basic component of harmony, pitch, is simply an oscillating rhythm at a speed that our ears can only process as a continuous tone. Now, if I did this fast enough, it would become pitch. Now, on the other end of the scale, the combination of pitch as harmonic change and tonal structure is just rhythm writ large, a rotation that our ears can only process as formal structures. Form is just big rhythm. So in music, everything is rhythm. Now, the same can be said of our universe, because everything in the universe repeats, from the looping membranes of string theory to the massive shudder of gravitational waves. As soon as there's repetition, there is rhythm. The vibrations, the oscillations, the rotations of the universe function as a universal, a kind of background rhythm that is a fundamental condition for existence. As Catherine Pickstock underlines, non-identical repetition is the reality of our world. And as long as there is time and space, there is repetition. The universe is rhythmic. Okay, I need a breather, man. I've been making this video for four or five days now. I've lost count and I'm exhausted and I've lost where I'm going. I mean, you're probably asking the same question. You know, where is Daniel going with all this? In fact, you're probably asking, when is this man going to stop? Well, I don't know. I'm in the middle of making this video. So the bad news is I'm probably only halfway. But anyway, I, I thought I'd better make some kind of a summary of uh, where we've been so far so that I can figure out where we're going next. So I've made this summary mostly for myself, but um, you can eavesdrop if you like. I began by saying that the research question, is music joy, was a mistake. Nobody believes in music and joy today. In fact, the modern underpinning for Western music is a tragic one, even for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. But then I said to myself, if you look at the ancient world, music was joy. In fact, it was a way of flourishing in the universe. So I said to myself, is it possible to bring that ancient world into the modern world? And the answer is no, because everything has changed. And then I asked myself, well, can't we retrieve a little bit of it? And I said to myself, yeah, maybe that's possible because modern joy still has aspects of that ancient world where music and joy were connected. Joy today is still a fitting structure, something permanent that is open. It is a general form of emotion. And then I asked myself, well, is it possible then to connect this joy to music today? And I said, 
No, it's not possible because music theory is still ironically fixated with Pythagorean harmonic order. And the problem with that harmonic order is that it supports an ancient joy that tends to be one of control. The underbelly of that joy is one in which joy can become authoritarian coercion. But then I said, but you don't have to think of music as harmonic. You could think of it as rhythmic. In fact, music is fundamentally rhythmic. And in that way, we could connect music and joy to the modern world. So you see why I'm very, very, very dizzy and totally exhausted. But anyway, let's get back to making this video. <laughs> Okay, where was I? Yes, rhythm. Rhythm. Now, a rhythmic universe is very different from a harmonic universe. You see, a rhythmic universe isn't fixed like a piece of string from end to end and divided into permanent proportions. No, a rhythmic universe is infinite. It just keeps repeating itself. It goes on and on and on, like this lecture. It has this compulsive addiction to addition. Numbers cannot control rhythm. Not even words can control rhythm. In fact, rhythm makes nonsense of words. Take this song by the police. A simple sentence like, I can't stand losing you, becomes like this. I can't, I can't, I can't stand losing. I can't, I can't, I can't stand losing. I can't, I can't, I can't stand losing. I can't stand losing you. 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 Or take this more modern example from Carly Rae Jepsen's recent hit song, I Really Like You. It goes something like this. Yes, really. Rhythm makes nonsense of linguistic meaning and numerical control. Instead of propriety, rhythm is inappropriate. And this is not just in relation to words and to numbers. It is also inappropriate for the body because rhythm causes the body to move involuntarily. This improper reflex known as entrainment makes you want to dance. First, you start tapping your fingers and then you tap your toes. And before you know it, you're gyrating like Elvis. Everybody, let's roll. Rhythm is precisely what is dangerous in a harmonic universe. It is infectious, bodily, generative, uncontrollable, uncontainable, and it can knock an ascetic order off balance in a beat. If rhythm were joy, it would be the wrong type of joy for an aesthetic disposition of moral integrity. It would be too playful, too effusive, too brainless for that killjoy kind of joy that keeps things in perfect order. Pure joy may be an abstract general form for Roberts, but a rhythmic joy is paradoxically a formless structure. Its fit exceeds its size. It is always more than rather than just right. The surprise of such joy is not just in its serendipitous fit. It is also in its effusive surplus. The continual abundance of joy points to the key difference between a harmonic cosmos and a rhythmic cosmos. You see, in a rhythmic order, the cosmos is indestructible, whereas a harmonic cosmos is highly precarious. Rhythm as repetition is both infinite and cohesive. The additive units stick together. Whatever you throw at it, in fact, the more you throw at it, the more disruption there is, the more the units want to stick together and to create more rhythmic patterns. Any musician or composer who has worked with ostinato patterns or a drum track will know exactly what I mean. Rhythm is elastic, it is capacious, it is tolerant of the dissonant other. In fact, it thrives on dissonance and disruption. It has a high pain threshold. Its joy suffers gladly. Now, a harmonic universe, on the other hand, is dangerously fragile 
because it is too perfect for its own good. The smallest hairline fracture would cause the whole cosmos to shatter. Indeed, the history of Western music theory was an elaborate attempt to paper over this tiny little crack. But the whole crystalline edifice collapsed anyway, and the modern world has not been able to put this harmonious Humpty Dumpty back together again. If joy is indestructible, then it needs to be primarily rhythmic and not harmonic. Joy, then, is not simply what Roberts describes as a concern that is satisfied, that is a harmonious fit. No, joy is a disproportional fit. It is not a proportional beauty, but a disproportional one. Now, since I'm speaking to the Yale Divinity School, I thought I'd better do a little bit of scriptural analogy here. So, in the Gospels, the word beauty is interestingly only mentioned once. Uh, during a dinner conversation, Jesus speaks of a beautiful thing. Kalon ergon. These words literally mean a work of proportion. But this work of proportion was so disproportionate to anything imaginable by Jesus' followers that they were indignant at this thing of beauty. As far as they were concerned, this thing was neither beautiful nor good, as Kalon is sometimes translated. It was improper. A woman, Mary Magdalene, had broken an alabaster jar of pure nard worth one year's wages and poured the perfume in its entirety on Jesus' head in front of the dinner guest at Simon the Leper's house. It was an extravagant act of worship, simultaneously lament and adoration anticipating the imminent death of Jesus by anointing him for burial and acknowledging a debt of love with an act so costly that it was deemed wasteful by the offended onlookers. Remember what Judas said? Why wasn't this perfume sold and given to the poor? And Jesus says, she has done a beautiful thing. Mary's act of anointing is in response to a saviour whose love compels her by its disproportionate nature to respond in proportion, that is, disproportionately in adoration. In other words, this is joy. Of course, Mary's act is a lament. A true lament, however, is only possible if the hope of joy exists. Otherwise, Mary's act would be one of total despair. It would be empty, it would be utterly pointless, which was in fact the case for the ascetic moral universe of Judas. Joy is the open form underlying this act of lament. It makes the act of lament a beautiful thing. Joy, then, is this rhythm, which, like the fragrance lingering in the room, is uncontainable. It is a formless structure, and this rhythm will become this trembling joy, as the Gospel puts it, that Mary will experience on the morning of Jesus' resurrection. What Mary sets in motion, then, is a beauty, that is, an aesthetic fit, that is, ineffable, that is, there are no words involved, and uncontainable. The perfume is out of the jar, and incalculable. Any attempt to count the numbers and give the money to the poor would be inappropriate. This motion is the rhythm of joy. Deus creator if we are to reconfigure this relationship between joy, music, and theology, then you might imagine that this would be found in St. Augustine's De Musica. These six volumes are all about rhythm. Unfortunately, Augustine simply applies the Pythagorean proportions to poetic metre. These are very proper rhythms. They are to be contemplated passionlessly, without the body, in order for you to arrive at these divine, immutable, eternal truths. But to arrive at this state of rhythmic nirvana takes such mental exertion that it would probably give you a headache. Joy in the Musica 
is beautiful in theory, but in practice it is exhausting. But thankfully, Augustine has another way. He has another type of rhythm, a rhythm that is far more earthy and mundane. And this rhythm takes you on a different journey, but it arrives at the same divine destination. And this type of rhythm is called the melisma. What is a melisma? In a melisma, instead of fitting one syllable to one note, the note generates lots and lots of notes, and the syllable extends wordlessly, as it were. It's a form of rhythmic propulsion or rhythmic effusion. I've asked my good friend, Common Bat, to magically appear and give us an example from Handel's Messiah. Rejoice, 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 Christy! Oh, thank you, Carmen. In the aria, rejoice greatly, the last syllable of the word rejoice is extended disproportionately. Rejoice, rejoice A few measures later, this melismatic extension becomes even longer. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. The melisma makes the syllable sound rather silly. In Handel's aria, the syllabic silliness could be explained as a kind of musical word painting. The melisma sounds like the joy of laughter. I mean, someone could tickle Carmen and you would get a similar effect. <laughs> now, we shouldn't have to justify the melisma as word painting, because melismas happen all the time. It is perfectly normal. This type of silly repetition is just what music does. And the melisma points to the fact that in music, the notes speak far more eloquently than the words themselves. They convey so much more. And this is precisely how Augustine understood the melisma. The melisma speaks of the ineffable. It speaks of a joy that cannot be put into words. Words for Augustine are always going to be restless, but the melisma points to an ineffable condition of rest, a joy without end. It is as if the melisma names joy perfectly. But to read about this type of rhythm in Augustine, you have to move away from the musica and read his commentaries on the Psalms, particularly on the Psalms that are performative speech acts, such as Sing to the Lord a New Song. In Psalm 32, the exhortation is not only a song, but a song that commands one to sing, because the song is not only about jubilation, it is in itself the act of jubilation. To sing it is to be it. Or, as Augustine himself would say about the psalm, this is to be sung with our tongues and with our very lives. Now, for Augustine, the newness of this new song is in this rhythmic excess that spills out as melismatic improvisation. That is at the heart of jubilation. Praise is improvised joy. And the quintessential example of this, he says, is something known as the jubilus. Now, the jubilus isn't some kind of liturgical, celestial, rhythmically proportioned chant. No, the jubilus is sweaty, it's smelly, it's bodily, it's earthy, it's definitely a low-class rhythm. It's a kind of Augustinian heave-ho, heave-ho. This is the sound of labourers in the field, toiling and harvesting. This is the rhythm of hard work work. Listen to what Augustine writes about the jubilus in his commentary on Psalm 32. What is it to sing in jubilation, asks Augustine? To be unable to understand, to express in words what is sung in the heart. For they who sing, either in the harvest, in the vineyard, or in some other arduous occupation after beginning to manifest their gladness in words of songs, are filled with such joy 
that they cannot express it in words and turn from the syllables of the words and proceed to the sound of jubilation. The jubilous is something which signifies that the heart labours with what it cannot utter. And whom does jubilation befit but the ineffable God? For he is ineffable whom you cannot speak. And if you cannot speak, yet ought not be silent, what remains but that you jubilate? Now, notice that the labourers begin by normal singing, and then as they work to the rhythm of their toil, they begin to improvise their melismatic songs. This is the sound of joy. But notice that they are actually in a moment of hardship and pain. They are toiling, but because of the hope of this bumper crop to come, they are filled with a joy that is as generative as the many notes in these melismas that they're singing. And also notice that this is not a nice kind of sound. It's a kind of grunting, really. And Augustine says that when you are running out of words to praise God, you have to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And the noise here is the operative word. Carol Harrison compares this noisy singing to singing in the bath. It's the aquatic equivalent of the jubilus. Now, to refine her definition a little, this is not just any old singing in the bath, but the kind of singing in the bath where you begin with a song and then you forget the words, but you keep singing anyway because you're having so much fun. It's kind of like, you know, luck be my lady tonight. I mean, you know, we all do this in the bath, right? Or did I just share too much there? Anyway, Augustine is basically saying that joy expresses itself in this kind of improvised, rhythmic, melismatic effusion. Now, when you formalize this into medieval liturgy, this might be regarded as the moment at the end of the Alleluia that launches off from the last syllable into a melismatic melee of joy. <laughs> And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the conclusion. Now my real self should be waking up about now. So this virtual self will speak for another five, ten minutes to give my real self some time to get changed, brush his teeth before the Q&A session. So here we go. Now with Augustine's jubilus in mind, let's return to Handel's Messiah and to the aria Rejoice Greatly. Now the fact that the melisma on rejoice is a form of word painting points to joy in both its mimetic and its structural sense. Content and form, in this case, coincide. The melisma paints joy as a giggle of notes, but it is not the actual representation of this emotion, but the structure of excess that is the key point here. Joy is an open form, a music that repeats itself recursively as a perpetual rhythm. Now you could replace the word rejoice with eggplant or baba ganoush, and the music would still jubilate, in fact, rather deliciously. Music does not need to be about joy in order for it to be joy. It is inherently joyful merely by being a melisma, which is to say that music in its purest form, when unconditioned by words or by numbers, is already joy. It is a semiotics of the abundant, an aesthetics of the how much more, and in a peculiar sense, it is about the signification of the superfluous. Oddly, such superfluous signs also constitutes the language of lament. George E. Valiant states, grief is joy inside out. It appears that in music, joy and sadness inhere secretly within each other. The excess that is laughter is also the excess that is weeping. The lament with its sighs and its sobs, its stuttering syllables and its agonizing groans is also a melisma beyond words. 
these paralinguistic markings are what Emmanuel Levinas would call the sensorial content of suffering. Its excessive and therefore useless signification underlines the intrinsic nothingness of such affliction. The pain, he writes, is for nothing. This refusal of meaning is a linguistic dysfunction, as if suffering were unutterable. In other words, grief is ineffable, and like joy, it is melismatic. In music, joy and sorrow coexist because they share the same stylistic form. Now, this may explain why these two contradictory emotions can coexist, but it also throws into doubt the very premise of my initial question, is music joy? The problem is that joy and sorrow become interchangeable and reversible. The question, is music joy, might as well be the question, is music sorrow? Because the answer would be exactly the same. Joy, then, would have no exclusive relationship with music. However, if we think about this a little bit more, in fact, joy and sorrow are not musically reversible. And the simplest evidence for this is found in the obvious objection that was raised at the very beginning of this lecture. Sad music exists. Duh. Yes, 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 sad music may exist. But the very fact that it is music ensures an order that is fundamentally not sad. However much sorrow wants to tear meaning apart, music keeps making sense of itself with its cohesive and generative reiterations. Thus, a lament may embody grief and the words may express sorrow, but as music, it can never truly despair. If it did, well, we just wouldn't listen to the music. So the content may be sad, but the form is always joyful. Even in music that deliberately aims for despair, observes Theodore Adorno, music cannot but express hope. Music insists on continuing. Ever since music has existed, says Adorno, it has always been a protest, a protest against fate and even against death. It always guarantees that there is an alternative. What Adorno calls hope is the structure of joy. It is a rhythm that continues, a structure that opens out, a melisma that reaches out for something more. From this perspective, sad music is inherently contradictory, which is probably why it is also so expressive. As with Mary Madeline's act of lament, music is a measure of joy that knows no measure except that of abundance. Its perfect fit is always more than enough. This means that the grumpy old men of music, Schopenhauer, the Kula Bartz, Lyotard, and so on, well, it means that they're not entirely wrong. They're just half wrong. It is the structure of joy that makes their misery in music so sublime. Similarly, if under the critical gaze, Beethoven's Ode to Joy is an odious joy with dubious politics, or if a song by the police obsesses over a jilted relationship to the point of suicide, such content can never exhaust or define the meaning of the music because there is always a musical surplus. There is always a certain grace, a rhythmic coherence that is the structure of joy. Music always wants to make sense. It wants to fit generously. If everything in the universe repeats, then the created order is musical. And if human beings make music in response to this rhythm, then our music points to an affective way of being in the world. Indeed, it does not merely indicate a way of being in the world, but a way of believing in the world. A doxological order points to the goodness of creation and ultimately to the Logos who composed it. And since this rhythm is ineradicable, indestructible, and constantly renewable, especially in the face of suffering and injustice, there is always a new beat that will keep us going. This is the rhythm of an unbreakable joy.
whatever the circumstances, however tragic, however violent, as long as music exists, nothing can seal its fate. By its very ineffability, music articulates a joy that refuses to end.